Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with TJ Ocean of Call on Doc. TJ, how are we doing? I'm doing great. Great. Good to hear. Good to see you. I'm excited about this. Yeah, I'm really interested because uh, this is all about digital healthcare and entrepreneurship. So we're going to kind of get into that and kind of talk a little bit about what that means. But before we get into all that, TJ, why don't you give us a little background? Who is TJ? Well, TJ is uh, is a Nigerian American. I um, relocated from Nigeria about over over 20 years ago. You know, just like um, your typical immigrant I had to work my way up the ladder took all the million jobs uh, out there to the minimum way to pay tuition, went to college, went to PA school. After that, went to medical school, started um, a medical practice and um, slowly transitioned into um, uh, business businesses and exited some of the businesses. And here I am today, um, CEO and founder of Call on Doc. So yes, give us, give us a little background. First, um, so you mentioned you went to PA school. So you, so you go to PA school. Uh, you you get your health degree. You're going you're going through it. You can create call on doc. So first, before we kind of get into the transition, tell me a little bit. What is call on doc? What does it do? Sure, call on doc is an online healthcare platform. I try to stay away from just telemedicine platform because we've transitioned away from that. It started out as a telemedicine platform, but we are now a holistic um, online healthcare platform that gives patient access to medical care. Um, and not necessarily just consultation with a doctor. We offer a wide range of services, including laboratory services. We actually have our own at-home um, lab kits where we build a facility in Dallas, Texas, where we are um, running labs. We also partner with multiple pharmacies to offer discounted uh, prescription drugs. Uh, we partner with imaging centers where we refer our patients um, for imaging services as well. We partner with multiple um, healthcare services so we can uh, refer our patients out to uh, specialists. As you know, seeing a specialist is, you know, hard already. So we make it simplifying the process, right? We've also pivoted just from um, direct to patient or direct to consumer to a B2B now where we're actually offering a service, uh, software as a service to um, uh, healthcare companies or businesses that just want to offer their um employees uh, healthcare access. So we, we're like a healthcare platform uh, in a holistic fashion. Nice. And I, I see how you, how you, the difference uh, or the intention of differentiating the telemedicine versus digital health. Cause folks, if, if you do telemedicine, it truly is just kind of a more of a consultation with a provider. Uh, you're kind of beaming in virtually uh, maybe it's an urgent care or primary care. Seldomly are you going to be able to do a really you know, complex uh, case of just because you do have to have the you know, hands on touching. But I would say the one thing that you mentioned that was very interesting that, that really telehealth does not have is the at-home labs you know uh, talk about how that kind of came to fruition and why the why that is so important absolutely like i said we started as a, at, um, a telemedicine company but because we understand the importance of labs and our patient direct you know traditionally don't like to go to doctors and as you know doctors need labs to be able to diagnose and treat patients so if you're a diabetic patient and you don't have lab, it's very hard to, to prescribe, prescribe your medication or refill your prescription. So, and I'm like, hey, I have to solve this problem. How can I do it, right? So I invested in this, built a lab and you know, delivered um, at-home tests uh, to our patients so they can facilitate the um, delivery of care. Uh, so that was how that came about, just in, uh, a way of uh, pivoting and offering better services to our patients and just meet them where they uh, where they need us. Can you can you tell us? So I think you know I would, I'm in the healthcare space. I've been in the healthcare space for uh, you know 20 years, over two decades now. Um, now one of the things I would say historically, hospitals and, and and you know ambulatories are going through right now is is access. You know access to a, an actual provider. Can you tell us how? Telehealth and, and digital health has been really revolutionizing patient access. And that's key, right? Well, that's one of the fundamental things that we preach is access and um, you know, affordability to be able to access doctors anytime. With technology, you can do that now. You know, with, with a tap on your phone, you can see a doctor in no minute. 
So with technology, you facilitate and remove all the red tapes that literally, you know, in, inhibits access to a doctor. As you know, most people don't see a doctor. And, and now let me take you back a little bit on how actually we started this. It started with um, um, a, a, a clinic I uh, co-founded in Dallas, Texas in 20, 2015, right? So we, um, we, we scaled the business, it was profitable, but we, we realized you know, we couldn't grow because of no shows and missed appointment, right? For obvious reasons, the reason why most people don't show up to the clinic is because of transportation costs, you know, you know, problem losing income, you know, calling out of work. So obviously the way to solve that is to bring the care to them, right? That goes back to the same thing as access, right? So if you're able to remove all these, um, red tapes and inhibitions that is stopping patients from accessing doctors, you can now provide access to them. A patient can wake up at 1 a.m. in the morning and see a doctor. Can you imagine that? 1 a.m. in the morning, we are, we are available 24 seven. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving night, if your doctor's office is closed, you can get your prescription delivered to your pharmacy and pick it up within 15 minutes, access. Yeah, and, and I that's really a phenomenal and, and, and remarkable because I, again, folks, I, I tell you, um, you, you know, you mentioned it, TJ, healthcare um, from an operations perspective, a 5% no call uh, on, a, on an outpatient clinic is, is disastrous uh, from an operational perspective and a, and a finance perspective. You have to understand that's, that's one in every 20 patients that are not coming into your, into your clinic, right, to get seen. Um, and and it, it, you have a lot of time gets put into being seen with these patients, a lot of uh, workup gets done. Um, and it's, it's, there's just a lot of things that kind of go into the play. Now, now I, I want to kind of talk a little bit about this call on doc. How, how does it work now? Do the providers, are you, are they employed by your team? Are they entrepreneurs? How, do, how does the call on doc system work? Absolutely. So one of the critical decisions I made earlier on in the, in, in, in the inception of the company was to make sure all the doctors were W2 and full-time. And the reason behind that, even though it's expensive is to provide continuation of care. And also because I wanted to make sure we we're available in all 50 states. Um, so I didn't go the independent doctor's route because it was, it was gonna be hard to manage. As you can imagine, there's no continuation of care. You don't see the same doctors over and over again. So we wanna make sure our patients are following up with the same doctors. The doctors, we spent so much time training them and we wanna be able to retain them. So our doctors are all full-time. We have some independent doctors here and there um, but our core doctors are all, you know, nine to five, clock in, clock out. They, they're passionate and devoted. They also like the fact that they're able to work remotely uh, from the comfort of their own. Um, I see my team as, you know, customers. So I make sure, you know, I'm also investing in the doctors because I know a happy doctor, happy patient. I truly understand that. So all our doctors are, um, are full time. And how and did you, by the way, have not just doctors, we have um, nurse practitioners and physician assistants as well. We have farm techs that is helping with the uh, prescription. We have medical assistant that's supporting the doctors. It's a whole team. Yeah, that's that's quite that's pretty impressive. Now, I'm I'm really interested to know how you, you know, you mentioned you kind of started out in Dallas, Texas, as a you know relatively um, financially steady private practice. And then you scaled into this to the point you now serve, you know, all the United States, right? All patients within all of the, all this, you know, all of the states with here and within the United States. Now, with that said, how the heck did you scale a company from a, being a private practice there in, you know, Texas to being all over the world or all over the United States? Luck. No, I'm joking. <laughs> it's never luck. It's always hard. It's, it's hard. always a bit of luck there, right? <laughs> it's passion, right? It's passion. passion. There you go. It's passion. You, you know, I say this, you have to go for what you're passionate about um, and just go in and, um, and obviously it has to, um, you know, show some type of fruition and, um, and, and, and what I get is the, the reviews that I get for my patient that have been, been able to change their lives, right? A patient um, that's out of a prescription medication and I'm able to come in and save them from, um, from going to the ER or, you know, even dying from not getting the vital insulin medication. Those are the things that keeps me going, that wakes me up in the morning um, and just help me um, drive. And I also have a team around me that's you know, passionate about this. 
But as you, as you said, it started like a clinic as a small clinic in Dallas. You know, I was able to build a website. So the first iteration of the website I built it myself and I slowly scaled and um, the feedback from the patients was just driving the force. Um, and I was, I was a little bit lucky in the sense that I was one of the first players in telemedicine. So I was able to um, write the SOPs on how telemedicine is actually done today, right? The prescription refill, the protocols that everybody follows now is what I had to uh, put in place. I called the medical, uh, uh, medical board um, in Texas at that time. I'm like, if, if it was okay to do telemedicine, this is way before COVID. Um, and they were like, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean telemedicine? <laughs> I'm like, well, I just to me need... on the phone. What do you mean? <laughs> right, right. I'm like, I just need to call patients. They were like, as long as you're documenting and establishing some type of medical necessity, you should be fine. I'm like, why don't you send me send, me, send that to me via email so I can have it documented? So there wasn't any protocol. There was you no know, any regulations or guidelines. So it was challenging. But as long as I knew I was doing the right thing and helping patients, I knew I was going to be fine. So that's how we started. And we just pivoted from the clinic and made it um, uh, an online scalable platform. You know, one of the things you mentioned was was passion. And I think I think with entrepreneurship, especially if you're the first mover in an industry, like you mentioned uh, in the telemedicine space, kind of being the first mover, uh, passion really is going to help propel you through those moments of entrepreneurship that are difficult when you're kind of by yourself, you're kind of working through the grit. Now, have you ever had a moment when you're kind of, you know, you mentioned you started the private practice and you went into this uh, call, call on a doc. Did you ever have a moment uh, uh, when you were kind of transitioning from private practice to being an entrepreneur of self-doubt? Um, self-doubt, um, that happens all the time. Um, it's, you know, high, it, it happens all the time from um, having issues getting credentialed for uh, a state that you really want to go in and you having to have that roadblock or having to transition from self-pay to insurance. All those obstacles are always there. But again, the passion will put you through and get you because you have an angle and you know where you want to go. We've never raised capital. Um, um, it's always been um, self-funded, bootstrapped, as a, you know, so it will be successful. And I, I, I want to make sure I set example also to people, uh, minorities like me, that you don't necessarily have to have capital to be successful. If you're passionate and offer good service, you will be able to uh, grow and scale the company as long as you're helping people, solving a problem and have the right intentions. I, I completely agree. I think, you know, getting out there and networking and building, um, you know, a very valuable product, you really truly don't have to raise capital because you're going to have a market that's willing to purchase your items at a very quick, uh, quick time. Now, how did you, uh, you know, how did you scale the business without taking on capital? You mentioned bootstrap. How did you kind of start that first iteration and how did you kind of get to the point where you now scaled it, you know, all across the United States? So that's the advantage of um, a first mover, right? You tend to um, grab a lot of market share um, and build a momentum around you. One of the things I invested in is good customer service and user-friendly um, uh, technology. I made a decision early on not to adopt one of the legacy EHR system and invest the capital in actually building a platform I can customize and personalize because I know at some point I'll be able to, you know, modify and change and be dynamic. So I didn't buy a telemedicine um, engine or EHR platform that had telemedicine. I had to build it from scratch. It was painful, but that helped me build um, a, a, the, the infrastructure. But again, customer service. So because of the customer service that we had, we have tons of positive reviews. We're one of the highest telemedicine um, rated company in, in the US. We have over 400,000 five-star reviews. I'm not counting the four, four stars or the three stars, almost uh, half a million uh, five-star reviews. That is leverage, right? That is leverage, yeah. right? And because of COVID, because of the reputation and infrastructure we had, we were able to scale from a couple of states during COVID, you know, and we were able to scale to all 50 states overnight. That that is that is quite impressive. And you know, I it's it's just really interesting because I think um, 
there's this kind of misconception that in order for folks to scale, they kind of have to take on venture funding or they have to do more. Uh, I, I think there's also the misconception that, um, listen, folks, if you, if you have a business going out there and you're, you're not, if, if it's operating in the red uh, and it has been for several years, putting more money into it might not necessarily be the solution. You might want to look at, you know, your spending habits. You might want to look at the operational workflow. Uh, there's a lot of other things that can go into that, uh, that you may not have noticed. Even scaling too quickly can have uh, financial detriments because you're, you're essentially, if you're sitting on too much product that you're unable to move because you thought you were able to scale at this, uh, at a pace that you're not able to keep up with because you don't have the employees, you don't have the shipping and all these other things. And now things are expiring. I mean, it's 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 very important to really understand uh, of what you're going to scale, how you're going to scale it, but then also like building the network. You know, building out the network, building out the team. How did you build out your network? How did you how did you get people involved into your uh, your call on the dock uh, program? Well, so I, because I had um, a, a medical clinic, so I had that foundation of build, bringing my team on board. Um, so I have, you know, family that's also in the medical space. So they were the first ones that I employed and they, they, they worked overtime and scaling this. So I was in a way, um, fortunate there. Um, but, you know, I started bringing uh, colleagues and friends on board as well, because it, they saw the, um, the vision and the, um, comfort in this, you know, and that's how we slowly scaled. Uh, the company and it, and it was a slow process. It wasn't overnight. It was calibrated and strategic. So we were always following our marketing dollar. Okay, we permit projections and hire doctors accordingly to where we're able to do that. But as you can imagine, you know, it, the process of being able to um, remove myself as a CEO of the company and just having um, a CEO run the company, it's also painstaking. But again, building a team is a science on its own, right? But it, it, yeah, that's how we're able to do it. Just a strategic, slow process. Now tell me, I would, I'm interested to know what would, you know, from private practice over to become an entrepreneur, what would you say was kind of the most difficult piece about that transition or maybe something that you didn't really think about in the private practice world that you had to do as an entrepreneur that you're like, wow, didn't know about that. Well, um, I think what comes to mind is, um, you know, what I've been able to do, um, learn to, to remove myself from the company. Uh, and that's how you can actually scale. You have to be, you have to remove yourself from the company. I read a book that actually changed everything and put everything in perspective. It's called uh, The Lazy CEO, right? You have to be the lazy CEO. You, when there's a problem, you go in, solve the problem, train your, train your team, and exit quickly. So your team can actually be empowered and you have to be able to trust them. Um, another thing that's really, really important, you know, we are um, most um, founders and CEO is they expect the, um, their team to perform at the same level. Well, what the book taught me is if you can get 80% out of them, you're fine. So I just wanted the 80%. I trained my team, delegated, empowered them, and um, made sure they were giving 80%, that was sufficient. And you can now, you know, dedicate your time to doing other things. Um, so nuances like that, reading books, empowering yourself, educating yourself, always help. You know, there are a lot of uh, smart people out there, read their books and just get from their ideas and scale from that, right? I didn't go to business school, but I was able to read a lot of books. Yeah, folks, I got to tell you, I think we are in like the golden era of education and information where you truly do have an opportunity to absorb so much free information, either from your phone or a library that's free, a podcast like we're doing now. Uh, and it's all free education and it's all out there um, because there are difficult times when you're just not going to want to continue to move forward and, and you're trying to figure things out and that passion is going to come through. And then, but there's also things that you're kind of trying to like, you know what I'm passionate about, but I just don't know enough about it, you know, and go out there and learn it, you know, get out there and, and really truly understand it and try to figure it out. Try to see, see what, what you can do. Uh, because again, there are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, solutions out there to problems that people have not found yet. And that's, I think the, the best part about entrepreneurship is, is identifying a solution to a problem that people have. And then 
you know, people actually willing to, uh, you know, take you up on that opportunity to learn more uh, about it. Now, how, what process, you know, one, one of the things you talked about was, and I think this is something entrepreneurs struggle with a lot, like truly is being able to offload some of those tasks, right? Being able to not have to feel that they have to be the jack of all trade master of none. What have, what tactics did you implore for your current organization to empower your employees to feel when these issues arise, they now have kind of a process to follow? Right. It, it starts with actually um, hiring the right person. And you may not hire the right person initially, right? It may be a trial and error process because you never know. There may be, they may be excellent in the resume, but uh, you know, hands on, they may, um, you know, be poor performers, but, you know, once you identify a, a, um, a golden employee, invest in them, train them, raise, you know, treat them like the queen, um, and just, you know, pay them well, right. And empower them, right. They will deliver some of the employees you wouldn't imagine. They actually want to take the, take the, take up that role. And when you see the, um, the signs, or the signal in those, um, you know, team team members, you know, just empower them and and give them all the resources and just trust them. You know, you know, there will be times where they fall short, right? You know, pick them up, guide them, support them, and just trust them. And they will learn. You know, as I learned, I give them examples of when I had to um, face certain obstacles and when I had to pull through. That kind of motivates them as well. But it's it's about building your team and in a sl slowly, right? Obviously, and scale from that, right? And once you understand the fact that you have to build a team, you start when you hire, you start looking at it from that perspective. Is this someone that can actually work independently, uh, right? And not necessarily depend on me to make decisions for them, right? Right. So that's that's how you tend to do it in terms of building a team and just trusting your team to be able to deliver. Yeah. And I, and I imagine your, your, your business is interesting because I, I, it seems like you, you kind of have a couple different target audiences. Uh, I would imagine like one might be the payers, right? The, the, the insurance people of the world. Another one, it might be other providers uh, that might be referring to your system. And the other ones are patients, right? The patient, how do you market to all these different, you know, marketing segments? Absolutely. So I never, I, I'm the king of mis I'm the king of focus. I stay focused on the core business, which is DTC, right? I stay focused on that. Um, but then I have um, a team leads in all the other departments that actually manage that. Um, so we we have a B two B department where there's a team that sort of um, CEO in that department also that manages that. But my core focus is in the DTC. You know, I, I try to make sure you know I stay true to that because that's the bread and butter. But it's all about building a team and a department that will run itself, um, right? And you just come in and sort of be more of a strategic partner versus in the operations of things. Yeah, and it's, it's that, that's a great point too. Is um, the operations of each one of those kind of you know targeting each one of those markets is very different as well. You know, it's, uh, and that's why I love about entrepreneurship is. It kind of really depends on who you're targeting, and then you have to understand what do they actually like, uh, and then where are they actually absorbing this information? Are they on LinkedIn? Are they at concerts? Are they at farmers markets? Like, where do they primarily uh, reside? And that kind of goes back into that understanding your customer profile, you know, uh, and really doing it. Now, do you is your team primarily just focus on general health, or do you provide other specialty services? So we uh, we don't. We just provide general health, you know, direct to patient general health, but we're partnering with multiple uh, specialists now where, you know, if if you came in for a, a psychiatric condition, we'll refer you to one of our uh, partners. So but our core is uh, primary care slash urgent care services. But again, like I said, we have multiple partnerships so we can um, offer more verticals. Nice. Now, TJ, what, what does the next five, 10 years look like for Call on Doc? Where, where do you envision the future for Call on Doc? So, so what, what, I, what I tend to do is actually facilitate the growth of telemedicine, you know, or digital healthcare as a whole. How can I support oncoming uh, businesses that want to venture into digital health, you know, by providing them to the technology, right, by providing these the, the white label 
at home white you know, test kits if you want to offer it to you is really empowering empowering a lot of companies so like i said we're slowly moving from the d2c to b2b and just sort of power um digital uh, online companies out there uh, and and also um leveraging ai to um optimize patient care there are multiple ways you can actually empower patient through information right and ai as you can imagine can do that for you um so we invest in a lot of um our capital in optimizing ai where you, when you come into our platform we you can have an avatar doctor not real life doctor help you formulate a treatment plan and make recommendations for you before you see actually see the doctor and it will tell you when you need to see a doctor when you need to go to the er or if you need some lab tests so those processes will be automated um obviously that that we still have to uh, get some type of um, um licenses for that but those are the technologies that we work in so that way when we um have the next covid uh will be ready and technology will be able to come in and and patient will still remain to have access may not have to have access to medical care you know, that's a, that's a great point. I think we're we're seeing the implementation of artificial intelligence within the healthcare space a little bit more and more. Where do you see AI kind of um, continuing to evolve healthcare? And do you see there are other entrepreneurial endeavors that you might encourage folks to kind of explore in the AI space when it comes to healthcare? Well, the challenge challenge that um, the healthcare faces is, is the last to adopt um, technology, uh, which sort of makes it hard to uh, partner or uh, find anything in the open space or you know, open source to uh, embed in your system, um, and primarily because of um, the regulations and um, red tapes again. So it makes it very hard to yeah. innovate. There are a lot of uh, in, in, innovations or ideas that we can implement, but we've not been able to get approval for that. Um, but there's tons of opportunity for now. All we can offer is uh, information, you know, find being able to leverage patients' data to provide, um, uh, you know, optimized care for them, right? If a patient had diabetes, we can now predict um, the outcome with the medication and rec make recommendations based on um, information. So those are the, the limitations that we have now. There are tons of opportunity, but there's so much restrictions and, and, um, and regulations that's preventing the, um, the, the, the opportunities that we can actually see. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point, TJ. I gotta tell you folks, um, it's really interesting. Healthcare, you kind of assume is like cutting edge forward, first on the mark, and we're not. Uh, when I first started in healthcare, uh, our electronic medical record was um, A2K. It was a black screen with green lettering, like the old Macintosh kind of computers. That was our electro electronic medical record. We didn't actually change over to Epic until like 2001, I think it was, or 2008. I can't remember exact date. But yeah, I mean, we we still use the A2K model for a long time. And it, and to TJ's point, there's a lot of red tape, a lot of kind of um, things you're going to have to go through. And I think that's the same thing with FDA approval. Uh, you go through clinical trials for medications or different procedures. There's just a lot of, lot of red tape. And I think too, to that point, TJ, there's, there's still a lot of fascinating growth to be had within the healthcare space. I truly believe that if you look at cancer and the evolution of immunotherapy in the last five years, it has been absolutely remarkable. Uh, if you look at, in fact, I just recently interviewed um, the, uh, the uh, diabetes um, app, what is it called? Uh, I think it was Verba or Ver Verda, and they're, they're phenomenal, right? What they're able to do uh, and how they're able to continue to really break down uh, the diabetes world and actually help cure type 2 diabetes through nutrition, right? Which is kind of how diabetes really starts, you know, a lot of it, uh, except type 1, unfortunately. But still, uh, it, it's really cool what's happening in the healthcare space. And, and if I'm, I'm, I'm selfishly encouraging people look, uh, listening right now, to look at the healthcare space as opportunity, business opportunities to innovate. I think the healthcare space is, is starving for innovation. Uh, I think there's a lot of innovation to be had, and it doesn't necessarily need to be on the patient care side. Um, you know, TJ was mentioned he had to create his own electronic medical healthcare record system because one, the current ones right now, I mean, if 
Epic is the kind of creme de la creme, right? It's an 80 or 60% market share. However, it still isn't the best. It's still very difficult. It's like an onion. Uh, you can, you can, you can custom Epic any way you want. It has different layers. And the more layers you pull, it's like an onion, the more you cry. Cause it's just like, oh my God, why, why can't you make this simple? I have a beacon for oncology. I have the, I have the pack system for imaging. And then it's like, they're all over the place. And so it's, 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 if you have a uh, folks, if you have an idea in the healthcare space, I would highly encourage you to get out there and, and innovate and try to work in that space. You know, it would really, I think healthcare is starving for innovation. Absolutely right. It's so many opportunities, untapped opportunities, ways you can help patients, outcomes. Please, you know, explore this opportunity. Yes, you're, you're welcome. It's, it's such an opportunity and, and a golden opportunity for everyone to step in. Yep. Yep. Now, folks, uh, for, so TJ, if there's folks listening that are interested in connecting with you or maybe learning more about Call On Doc, how can they connect with you online? How can they find you on the website? Absolutely. So the website is callondoc.com. Uh, we can be on Facebook. We're active on Facebook and all the other social media. You can watch our, our YouTube videos, um, you know, but you can always reach us on our website um, and our team available to assist you. We have an app that you can download anytime. Um, you know, we are available 24 seven. If you need a medical service, you can just download the app. Now any consultation through the app gets, um, five dollars off because we encourage patients actually uh, using the app because it's more it's user friendly, uh, more secured, and there's so many benefits there. So I'll say go ahead and download the app now. You may not need our service right away, but whenever you do, one a.m. with uh, two a.m. with uh, on holidays when you need a prescription refills, we're there for your basic primary care primary care needs. You know, if I tell my my buddy in my group text this all the time because I work in healthcare and. I'll be, you know, working two in the morning sometimes. I'm like, folks, healthcare doesn't sleep. It's a, it's the one industry, no matter what, we don't sleep. We're we're constantly there's somebody constantly at the hospital or clinic or somewhere. Uh, it's it's just it's remarkable. TJ, thank you again so much. And folks, if you if again if you want to connect with TJ, if you want some more information, go ahead and visit the uh, the shades of e.com and subscribe to our newsletter. We'll have TJ's information on the newsletter. We'll also have a dedicated blog post and a dedicated page with TJ's website photo and a transcription of our conversation and an audio. So if you would like to actually stream this conversation, you have that as well. TJ, are there any last words you'd like to say to the folks listening? Yeah, um, I mean, this was um, a fun experience. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I, I always empower uh, my patients. I always leave them with um, uh, preventative medicine, you know, diet, exercise, and live a healthy life. Uh, preventative med medicine is the way to go. You know, patients over 25 years old should be checking their blood pressure regularly. It's one of the silent killers. You can check your blood pressure at any pharmacy these days. Anything over 135, 140, see a doctor immediately. You can also do your annual check. They're available online now. You can buy your kit anywhere if you can't make it to a doctor. They're mostly affordable now. Checking your kidney, liver, once a year, it's it's an important step you can do to prevent any chronic diseases, right? And just live a long life, right? Yeah, yeah, folks. Uh, again, listen, I, I check my like I, I got a heart monitor. I got my, I check my blood pressure. I do that on a pretty consistent basis. Uh, you can purchase one of these little guys at Target for like ten, fifteen dollars. Um, it, it's just, again, I use it before some of my uh, doctor appointments, just if it, it is telehealth, so they have that information. Also, like TJ mentioned, it's just good to monitor it. Uh, good to, good to continuously, you know, uh, monitor your own health. I think in the next, I think the statistically by like 2030, we're supposed to, or 2050, I think we're supposed to be living on average to about 90 to hundred years old. So, and I, I think that is a, a testament to the, the, the kind of innovation that we've been having within the healthcare space and, and the quality of life and that we're able to see is continuing to rise. TJ, again, thank you so much for this conversation. Really, again, I'm really impressed that you guys are on all 50 states. Uh, very awesome. And again, folks, if you forget all of TJ's information, you can subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter by visiting the Shades of E. 
www.ltd.com. You can also follow us on the social sites, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Sorry, I'm no longer on Twitter, uh, TikTok, but all the other ones just go ahead and uh, at the shades of E. And if you so do so, if you actually enjoyed all these conversations, you can become a Patreon member for $5 a month and actually help support the show so we can continue to bring on guests like TJ. So again, TJ, thank you again so much for your time. So folks listening at home, thank you and have a great night.